Well, hey guys, it's Joel and welcome back to the channel. And today we have got our hands on this gorgeous 997.2 911 Carrera 4S Cabriolet. And I'm going to give you my brutally honest opinion on it. Now, this particular car has been lent to me today, courtesy of my good friends at ePorsche. And you will have seen ePorsche on my channel before in their service capacity with my former Boxer and now my KN. I've had many, many works done to those cars over at ePorsche. And in fact, today, my 955 KN is in for some additional work. And so whilst that was going on, I thought I'd head over to the sales side of ePorsche and take one of their cars out. And this is what we have here. This particular 911 Carrera 4S is a 997.2, which makes it relatively few and far between. But amazingly, it only has 38 thousand miles on the clock now that's around three thousand a year making this a gorgeous gorgeous example so in the interest of transparency i must admit to you that this will be my first 997 driving experience i have passengered in a 997.2 turbo but never actually driven one of the models and i've had plenty of experiences in 996 in 991 and 992 thanks to my friends at Porsche UK. So this will be really interesting for me to work out where the 997 sort of fits into it all. And as mentioned, this is a facelift or dot two 4S Cabriolet, making it a particularly interesting model to start with. In fact, 2009 was the year that Porsche got rid of the Tiptronic for good and introduced the PDK, which we all know so well and love today. With that PDK, it meant that the updated revised 997 models like this were faster, lighter, and more fuel efficient than the 997.1 that preceded them. Now, many enthusiasts were quite pleased when the 997 originally came out because it did away with the infamous fried egg headlight design at the front that most people didn't like on the 996. I have to admit, I quite like it. I'd, I'd like the headlights on the 996 and 986 Boxsters, but they weren't popular. And so this new design got rid of that. And I think most people will agree that this is a slightly all round better looking car. Obviously when the second phase of 997 came out like this one, there was some more updates to the front, but also the rear lights did change. I prefer the earlier ones if I'm totally honest. The interior got some updates as well, which we'll go through a little bit more later on. But what we have here is the 3.8 litre engine in the S variant, which means we have 380 horsepower, which if I remember correctly, is the exact same amount of horsepower as the latest 992.1 911 Carrera. That was a absolutely perfect car in my opinion. I did actually film a brutally honest review with that car and 380 horsepower was just spot on. And so I'm hoping this will feel much the same. If you do wanna see my review with the 992 Carrera, then uh, you can click up in the top right hand side of the screen now. But this 380 horsepower Cabriolet, it should be absolutely fantastic. Looking around the car, I would admit that I've not found a bad angle. It's pretty beautiful from every single place you look at it. The other thing that's immediately noticeable when you stand next to a 997 is its size and the fact that it is still so almost dainty, very small. These were less than 1.9 meters wide, which by modern day standards sounds very narrow, four and a half meters long or thereabouts. And even in Cabriolet guys, they managed to keep these at around 1600 kilograms, which doesn't sound awfully heavy by today's standards either. This car's spec is nothing particularly exciting. In fact, it's black on black on black, but it is nice to see silver alloys. And I really, really like the design of these alloys. The other thing I noticed is that we have two, three, five section tires on the front, but at the back, there are massive 305 section. And last time I checked, that's probably gonna be north of 300 pounds for a rear tire, which is crazy. But from the pointy front nose to the aggressive width of the rear haunches, this is just one of those cars that I would say is almost perfectly proportioned and is just gorgeous to look at, especially with that rear wing up there. Now, these 997s, and in fact, the Carrera 4S Cabriolet that I'm in today, these were encroaching on 90, depending on options, 100,000 pounds when they were new, which seems crazy considering you can pick these up from anywhere around 30K today, depending on spec and mileage, of course. But I'm pleased to report that initial impressions don't make you question that. It does feel every bit as expensive 
as its original price. I've always loved the leather that they use in Porsches and particularly when it comes to older models like this, they always seem to wear and age very, very well compared to some other models of car. Also the design of the seats in the 997 I always found to be quite pleasing. They're relatively slim and if you were a larger person you might struggle to find comfort but these ones are the multi-way adjustable seats and you can do quite a lot with the bolsters to make them wider you can pull the lumbar right back to make the seat deeper and i think most people are going to find themselves being very comfortable in here in fact for me someone of an average build i've not actually had to adjust the seat at all and i've just been very comfortable in the short amount of driving i've done in the car so far today the steering wheel now this being a earlier dot 2 911 with the very first iteration of pdk has these weird thumb controls to control the gearbox you only got the flappy paddles as jeremy clarkson deems them later on i think around 2011 the pdk then came with paddles maybe 2012 you'd have to check me on that but here we have thumb controls or finger controls but they are definitely akin to be used with the thumb and they're quite strange we'll talk about it a bit more when we drive but essentially the logic with these is that if you pull you upshift and if you push you downshift and it's the same for both sides so you might find yourself intuitively pulling on this side to upshift and finding that you downshift it's a little bit confusing but you do also have the option to move the gear selector over and shift sequentially like that which i find is a little bit easier to do but apart from the gearbox controls the wheel is completely plain the rim itself is a really good thickness in fact it's perfect the leather on it has worn very nicely just like the seats and the rest of the car you can adjust the wheel uh, only manually it doesn't come out quite as far as i would like maybe i'm sat a little bit further back but for me this feels like the right place to sit and i just would like the wheel to be a little bit closer there is a hidden heated wheel switch on this which is behind the wheel here that's a really nice option to have. We've got cruise control, and then we've got the indicator and wiper stalks. On the right-hand side down here, we have the headlight switches. We've got the electronic window switches, electronic mirror controls, and also down here, the memory seat function, which is really good to have. My KN doesn't have memory seats, and both me and my wife drive it. We have vastly different driving positions and so to have memory seats is a real bonus especially if you might be sharing this with a partner or a friend there's nothing in the way of storage to the side of you here there's no door compartment where you can put your phone or anything like that we do have quite a generous glove box and a very small compartment which you might fit a couple of coins in there and also quite a modest central storage area here which you'd struggle to get a modern day phone in in fact so that is one of the immediate pitfalls i find with this cabin is there isn't really anywhere to put your stuff of course though being a 911 you do have rear seats and i think we all know by now that these are not really seats for sitting in in fact the angle of the backrest of these seats is so severe that if you did sit there you would literally be cramped over but what that does mean is the lack of storage in the front here is kind of made up for by the fact that we can put things on the back seats. Above the wheel then we have the extremely pleasing five Porsche dials. On the left hand side we have the oil temperature, we've got our speedo, big rev counter with a slightly over 7000 rpm red line. We also then have our water temperature, fuel gauge and oil pressure on the right hand side. I love how much information there is in front of you. You don't have to look anywhere else to access it. It is right there. Everything you're going to need to know when you're driving the car, you can see it at all times. I love it. And then we have the chrono pack on this particular car. Gorgeous leather stitching in fantastic condition on the dash and an upgraded Pioneer head unit in this particular car. So I can't really go through and look at the original features, but we can have a little bit of a look at what this particular unit does. So I don't believe this unit has Apple CarPlay, but it does have a navigation integrated, which is quite up to date. And also we now have the ability to stream music from our phone, which I think as standard wasn't something you could do with these. Correct me if I'm wrong, 
but also USB connectivity as well. It's a fairly nice screen and it fits into the original fascia very well. It doesn't look too aftermarket, so it gets a pass from me. Below the screen then, we have some controls. We have heated seats, which is always nice to have. Wasn't a given on these, despite paying almost a hundred grand, heated seats were still an option. So do be careful if you're in the market for one, uh, because heated seats may not be as standard. And they might be missing. And from what I've heard, they're not always possible to retrofit officially from Porsche. So do bear that in mind. But the buttons themselves feel very well made. And again, remember how old this car is. Despite that, they still feel brand new. Heated front and rear screens and a temperature control and fan control for the air conditioning, which still blows ice cold, which is really nice. We can set that to auto and control exactly where it's going. None of this fancy integrated screen stuff. We have buttons for our air conditioning, which is really, really nice. Below we have PSM off, which is our traction control. So we can turn that off with the touch of a button again. We have a button here to control our spoiler at the back, which as you can see, I've put up manually because I just like the way it looks. Then have a button to control the suspension. We can put it into a slightly firmer setup, Sport Plus and Sport, which we can talk a little bit more about what they do as we drive the car. Then we have the PDK shifter itself. This is the same as the later models that got the flappy paddles. It's just we have the thumb controls, um, but this is a really nice feeling shifter actually. It feels very expensive. And yeah, we have the ability, like I say, to flick it across into manual and shift the gears that way. And that's about it. Obviously this being the Cabriolet, we uh, are a convertible and we have the buttons for controlling that down here. Now what we're going to do is get the roof off for the drive because that's the only way to experience a cabriolet isn't it? But quickly I should just touch on the storage in the front. Of course the engine is in the back with it being a 911 so we only have a front or front boot and it's a pretty good probably average size of a car in this sort of class. You could get a cabin bag and maybe a soft bag in there or you could squeeze two or three soft bags in there if you didn't have a suitcase. It's gonna be fine for a weekend away with the wife, maybe a little bit longer if you're on your own. But do remember, because it's an 11, you have the rear seats and let's assume you're not gonna be carrying passengers. Uh, you can get an additional couple of bags and a rucksack back there too. So you're not really gonna have any problems if you do plan on using this on a longer adventures. Also, fantastic cup holder design for you and your passenger here. Again, just feels so well made. And these are so well designed because you can adjust them and extend them for larger cups and they stir away like so. When you're buying one of these, do check that they're still working because they can get sticky and they can break. And I'd imagine they're a little bit of a pain and quite expensive to fix. And you're gonna want those cup holders because there is nowhere else to put anything at all. Okay, so out in the Carrera 4S then, and it's just turned July, and we're in the UK, no prizes for working out what's just happened. It's just started absolutely tipping it down, but I'm still confident we'll be able to get the roof down in just a little bit. So initially then, the car is very comfortable. It's quite a noisy car. I think that's largely helped by the fact we have these massive tires, but also we're of course in a cabriolet. The ride quality feels immediately Porsche. It's firm, but it's very steady, and the car doesn't get upset by imperfections in the road. It deals with them very well. The engine itself is extremely quiet. We're at 45 miles per hour now, seventh gear, because of course this is a seven-speed PDK, and we're trickling along at just over 1,000 RPM. At this point, there's not really any sense of the 3.8-litre six-cylinder engine in the back or really any sense that we're in something that's quite quick. It is a very civilized thing to drive, a very easy thing to drive too. Despite the fact we've only got a small rear window, the visibility is fantastic. The wing mirrors not only give you a really pleasing view of the massive wide haunches at the back of the car, but a very good view around the car too. Blind spots are basically non-existent, maybe a slight one over where the roof is on the passenger side. But all in all, this is a very easy thing to drive. The gearbox is quick to respond, even at slower speeds. It goes through the gears instantaneously. And so driving around town is never going to be an issue with a car like this. 
Let's see what it's like though when you drop it down a few pegs. So coming onto a slightly faster bit of road now, I'm just gonna put my foot halfway down and it stayed in fourth gear and there's a lovely amount of torque there. I think it's only around 300 pounds feet of torque. All of the power is at around six and a half thousand RPM, but Porsches always seem to have a way of just feeling faster than they really have any right to. On paper, I believe the 0 to 60 on this thing is around four and a half seconds and it will go on to around 180 miles per hour. Let's go for a little bit more power now. Yeah, it's dropped down into second and you can feel, wow. You can feel the power surging as you go through the revs. It's really lovely. It's such a progressive power delivery. You can feel sort of every thousand RPM, you've got about 10% more power. And that goes on, like I say, all the way to about six and a half thousand RPM where it peaks. Let's put it into sport mode and try out the paddles a little bit here. So I'm just gonna use these. That's right, you pull it back to downshift third gear, three and a half thousand RPM, foot down, and upshifting by pushing the paddle, which is very strange. And like I say, not particularly intuitive. If you go for a later one, of course, you'll have the updated wheel with paddles, but they do actually have a 997 in stock at the moment where the previous owner changed the wheel himself. So you, you can retrofit the the newer paddles and newer wheel if it bothers you that much. But I think you probably would get used to it after a little while. It is a fantastic gearbox and as you can hear, the shifts are instantaneous. It's only marginally slower than what you find in the latest 992.2. And when you upshift right at the red line around seven and a half thousand RPM, you just get a slight surge of noise from the back, which is very pleasing indeed. In sport mode, it automatically activates a stiffer suspension setting. And you can notice that as you drive along, you're bouncing around a little bit more and the car becomes slightly disturbed by bumps in the road. However, what's great is we do have the ability, if we don't want it, to switch that off. So we get the benefits of sport nonetheless with a slightly smoother ride. Handling, as you can expect from any Porsche, really responsive, really communicative, and we're in a 911, so all the weight is at the back, and that front end does get light as you push on a little bit around corners. It's a very addictive feeling, and one that's fairly unique to 911s. And if you've driven one in anger, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. So there we go. We've gone from zero all the way to third gear, and we've just hit about 65 miles per hour. So what's great is that you can use it all without doing anything silly. If you were to do that in the latest 911 Turbo S, you'd be at over 100, 110 miles per hour if you just did a pull like that. But although it's fast enough to give you a great kick, you can still experience it without breaking the speed limit, which is just so important these days if you intend on driving these cars on the road. Brakes feel really reassuring, and you do feel very much like you're in control. What I will say is that the 997 feels much more like a evolution of the 996. Whereas if you're to step into a 991, it feels like an entirely different car. It feels much more grown up. The 997 is probably for someone that wants a slightly more raw driving experience. If you're looking for something more in the lines of comfort and daily usability, not that there's any issues with this for that, then the 991 has quite a noticeable difference when it comes to levels of refinement. This does very much feel like an evolution of the 996, almost like a, a facelift plus of the 996. 
and actually I am going to be driving a 996 Carrera 4S next week so if you're interested in seeing that make sure you subscribe to the channel as you can see the wipers are going slightly less frantically now and it seems like the rain has pretty much stopped so I'm a Britishman I'm going to take my chances and I'm going to put the roof down now let's see if I can do that actually whilst we're driving I'm not sure if you can on this car but we'll find out doing 17 miles an hour and nothing is happening ah I was doing it the wrong way haha <laughs> roofs going down that was quite quick actually that probably took no more than 15 seconds and immediately you hear so much more of that flat six engine behind that front end does go light under load into corners if you're not watching it this car can definitely definitely bite nice sharp left hander we're going to give it a little bit of beans again up here listen to that sound and it is like all Porsches I've driven really very very addictive indeed if you are a true enthusiast and a proper driver you're gonna love a Porsche just because of the way that the engine is set up a bit like a very good six cylinder BMW but slightly more extreme you're really really rewarded for going through the revs in this thing and every Porsche that I've driven is the same in that regard in terms of what this feels like with the roof down relatively unchanged actually it's not all that much noisier than with the roof up driving along at 45 miles per hour here and uh, it's very civilized indeed I'm not really shouting for you guys if I had a passenger next to me I could be speaking to them with no problems whatsoever and the other nice thing about this is that you don't really feel like you're causing too much of a nuisance it doesn't make an almighty noise out the back this one in its particular specification is quite unoffensive I'm not getting any rude hand gestures let's say from people driving by the same can't be said for when I did a review on a Ferrari 360 Spider not so long ago that attracts all sorts of unwanted attention so if you are someone that likes to enjoy your car but not feel like a show-off this is a fantastic option and I will just say that if you're a Porsche enthusiast in general or you're in the market for one of these or anything else between the sort of 10 and 40 grand mark with a Porsche badge then check out the ePorsche website because they're real specialists in that exact range of cars and the best thing is that all of their cars obviously go through the fantastic hands at the ePorsche service centre for a massive massive inspection before they go on sale and I will admit that this particular car doesn't drive like its age it feels I mean complete cliche but it, it feels brand new it does feel wonderful the steering is dead on straight the tracking is perfect and handling razor sharp there's not an inch of this car that feels at all loose or long in the tooth and although there is a nice gap between 996 and 997 I do think the 997 actually makes the 996 look quite good I wouldn't feel like those 996s are all that far behind they're a little bit more dated in a few areas but as a driving experience it's not all that much different whereas when you jump in a 991 there's a much more tangible and noticeable difference there and so maybe I would say the 997 is in a slight null zone where they're still commanding such values that a 991 a higher mileage example might not be totally out of reach but there's still quite a lot more than an equivalent 996 so it makes the 996 look quite attractive but it also makes the 991 look quite attractive because they are quite a big step ahead of this but not a massive jump in price range if that makes sense you know I really don't have many complaints at all at times it's a little bit fidgety maybe ever so slightly rattly especially with the roof up but right now I mean cruising along so civilized it's really quite lovely and that power plant is just sublime 
I must sound like a broken record because I do talk about this an awful lot in my reviews, but I think it's so important, especially with the way things are these days, that it's just not too fast, this thing. It's totally fast enough for you to have a giggle every now and then, but you'd actually be a bit stupid if you managed to get yourself in a lot of trouble driving this thing. You'd have to be through the floor on the throttle pedal for a long time to break any laws and I think that's just fantastic because it's so obtainable all the power and at 50 60 miles an hour on a country road you can feel the front end going light you can feel the car moving around a bit and in something more modern or more powerful 500 plus horsepower you've got to be going 100 miles an hour to start experiencing that because of the insane levels of grip and this is just a really nice sweet spot so examples like this one can reach anywhere up to around forty thousand pounds but you can get earlier 997s higher mileage examples for well within the twenty thousand pound budget and i think at that point it's certainly exquisite value for money i would personally say if you're going up to this level and you're spending 35 or 40 grand maybe look at 991 because as I mentioned a few times it's just a bigger step up I think than 996 to 997 and if you can afford the 991 maybe consider it but that's not to deter you from a 997 because as I mentioned earlier I still think these are probably one of the most pretty 911 generations ever. Okay, you can go back and argue that the 993 was very pretty and it is drop dead gorgeous, but I think the 997 for me is just perfectly proportioned, especially a wide body like this or even the turbo. So I'm gonna drive back to e Porsche now and try my absolute best not to buy anything because they've got a 987 in there at the moment. It's 2.7 but it's sort of a gunmetal gray with matching wheels, blue roof, blue interior. And it's something like 10 grand or a little bit less and 80,000 miles. Anyway, I'm extremely tempted by another Porsche. Um, I think my plan is actually to chop the KN in now that we're in the summer and get something a bit sportier. And it, it may well be another Porsche, especially with having these guys just down the road and some of the things they have in stock. It's very, very dangerous indeed, in fact, I've not had as much time to film this review as I'd planned for because I was chatting with John at ePorsche uh, for a good two hours about Porsches before I came out. And yeah, I'm going to have to refrain from buying that Boxer today, I think. But uh, do go ahead, uh, check out the website uh, to see their stock. It's always changing. They've always got some really interesting things in there. They've got a 991 in there at the moment. Like I said, they've got 987 Boxster, got a gorgeous 997 Targa actually, which is fantastic to look at. Um, so all the links are in the description. I'll leave a link to the listing for this car and a link to the ePorsche website as well. And of course, they do all the servicing too, like I have shown you before with my uh, KN and Boxer that preceded it. So yeah, thank you so much to John and to the ePorsche guys for letting me take this out for a review for you guys today. It's uh, been well, extremely enjoyable and I hope you guys have enjoyed watching the video. Thank you all so much and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.